when that discomfort or pain starts to breach into affecting someone's ability to do the things they either have to do or love to do every day, that's when I have an issue with pain, right? Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Dojo podcast where we bring real solutions to real health and wellness problems. Today, we're talking about lower back pain with our guest, Dr. Rebecca McAllister, a chiropractor who's passionate about helping people discover where their low back pain is coming from and how they can start to improve it. We hope you enjoy this episode. Let's get into it. All right. All right. We are here. Welcome back to the Wellness Dojo podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Crake. I'm here with Dr. Riley Anderson on my left. Hello, hello. How are you doing today? Wonderful. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good. Uh, We're really excited to have Dr. Rebecca McAllister here with us today, a chiropractor who's passionate about helping you fix your lower back pain. So welcome to the episode. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're excited. It's uh, excited to dive into a little bit about low back pain, help people understand it a little bit better and understand maybe how like what they can do and and how they can help their low back pain a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Seems to be a, a common ailment. Uh, I think that people struggle with healing it. The it, it can last forever. It can last for years and decades and before they really get some good help. Um, yeah. So before we get into all of that and the nuts and bolts, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? how you got to where you are today and why maybe why you're so passionate about low back pain in particular. Yeah, sure. So I decided I wanted to become a chiropractor actually at the age of 14. So when I was younger, I danced at a pretty high level and I played competitive soccer. And some days I was totally fine. I had no pain at all. And then other days I could barely walk because I had this opposite knee ankle pain scenario. And every doctor I saw was kind of like, well, you're young. And you're active, you're growing, it's your body telling you to slow down and take a break. And so we were like, okay, <laughs> like, fair enough. Um, and then one day I was in a dance class and my ballet teacher was correcting my posture on something and noticed that I had more muscle on one side of my spine than the other and asked if I had ever followed up with my pediatrician about it. And I said, no. <laughs> and she was like, okay, well, you might want to, you know, book an appointment with your pediatrician. And so we booked in with my pediatrician and he was like, I don't know what to tell you about your knee and your ankle pain, but I'll take a look at your spine. And he did. And he sent me for x-rays and it turned it turns out that I had um, scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spine. Mm -hmm. And so once I had that diagnosis, I actually was sent to like a variety of different specialists. I wore a couple of different back braces um, and I was young. I was like, you know, 13 or 14 years old. And. I was like, man, this sucks. Like I have more knee and ankle pain now than I used to. And I have back pain and I never had back pain prior. Um, And my pediatrician was actually a bit ahead of his time and referred me to a chiropractor. And my mom booked the appointment and I was like 14. And I was like, this is the last place I want to be. The last place I want to be on a Saturday morning is another (laughs) doctor's appointment. (laughs) And I went and my chiropractor at the time, he just did such a good job at um explaining to me how my back was relating to my knee and my ankle pain and took the time to really explain it to me and between him and my massage therapist who he ended up referring me to the two of them afforded me um, the most pain relief and pain management and i was just like this is so cool like if i could be that person for one other individual in my career it would all be worth it so yeah Hip bones connected to the yeah. leg bone. It's all connected, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I ended up um, getting into Cairo College. Um, and then, yeah, since graduating, I've practiced in PEI, Ontario, and now Alberta. Very yeah. exciting. PEI, Ontario, and Alberta. Yep. Awesome. Cross country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I know we had some similar stories with... Uh, going to Canadian islands after graduation, yes, that's right. pandemic hitting, yes. and, and then relocating yeah, after that. Totally. <laughs> and Calgary was the spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Calgary is the spot. Yeah. And now we're both happy and peachy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, it's, I think it's really common where people are experiencing all these different pains, whether it's like even like shoulder, knee, ankle, and it's so easy to just target to just where that pain is coming from Mm -hmm. but to look at the spine which is essentially the core of your entire body right 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Important. Yeah, definitely depending on like the patient presentation as well and what it warrants. Mm -hmm. Did did you have reservations as a 14 year old going into see a chiropractor for the first time? No, I had no idea what a chiro was. I just knew they were another doctor. And that was the last place I wanted to be was another doctor's appointment. I had been to so many in such a short time period. Um, And yeah, I just had a little bit of a bad attitude about it, I guess. I was tired of going to doctors and I was tired yeah. of being in doctor's appointments. I was tired of being in pain and frustrated that because no one had explained to me how it was all connected. And so I had this really um, like intermittent come and go knee and ankle pain. And then all of a sudden that became more frequent coupled with an onset of back pain, which I was like, what is this? Like, I never had back pain before. It feels like I'm getting worse, right? Mm. Because no one had taken the time to explain how it was all, until I saw my Cairo, until it was all connected. And and then that understanding gave me some peace of mind um, and helped me kind of get over that. Yeah. And so in your case, was it the, likely the scoliosis, the curvature of the spine leading to the ankle and knee pain? Yeah, so the way it was described to me when I was younger was, because I had a curvature of the spine my pelvis wasn't level and so at one point I think I had like a one centimeter difference in leg length and so my longer leg was coming down on the ground harder which was giving me some knee pain on occasion and my shorter leg was trying to curve to reach the ground Hmm. and so that was giving me ankle pain on occasion oh interesting yeah Mm -hmm. And then uh, do you remember what the treatment was like that, that you received with that first experience with the chiropractor? I, so I, was, I received a variety of treatments. So I was in a back brace for three or four years mm. for most of my high school. Um, and then with my chiropractor and massage therapist, it was a lot of um, like soft tissue work, um, adjustments, exercise rehab, mm-hmm. all the stuff you're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And were you able to continue playing sports or is that something that you had to shelf? No, I was able to continue playing. Um, I think retrospectively looking back on it when I had some of those bad uh, flare ups of pain, um, I definitely being 14 was kind of like, I don't know if I should be exercising or if I should be taking a break. Um, So again, having that professional guidance to kind of delineate what was an acceptable level of discomfort and what was maybe too much was also really helpful. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, if you're out there and you have back pain and knee pain, hope's not lost. Yeah. There are solutions. Yeah. It's nice that you had such a good experience with it early on in life, too, with having people who actually guided you and educated you, because I know that's something that you're now very passionate about is not just fixing people, but Mm -hmm. also like educating people and helping them understand that process as well. Totally. I know uh, I hear often from people that maybe haven't been to a chiropractor before and you know we suggest it quite you know maybe not quite often but but oftentimes I will suggest people like you know you might want to get an adjustment to help with you know these muscles that are so tense and stuff there might be something out of alignment and I do sometimes get people who are like "Ah, I'm just nervous about going to see a chiropractor like Mm -hmm. I don't want to get my neck cracked and like those types Mm -hmm. of things Mm -hmm. what do you say to those people or what could you tell those people to maybe ease their mind a little bit about what chiropractic actually is? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think the first thing that I always recommend to people, whether they're looking for a chiro or a physio or a massage therapist or a naturopath or a counselor psychologist is um, finding someone you trust and can build a strong rapport and relationship with, someone you're comfortable with to ask questions to um, and express concerns to because I think building that sort of rapport and relationship um, is kind of the foundational piece to achieving some of the health and wellness goals you might set for yourself. Um, Speaking specifically to myself, I know in my initial assessments, I always ask patients right off the bat if they have any ideas, concerns, or expectations. Um, And so that kind of opens the doorway for anyone to lay on the table what maybe they have some concerns or fears about. And you do hear that a lot, right? You'll hear people say like, I don't want my neck touched, but I'm here because I have low back pain right and it's like okay well we're looking at your low back today we won't touch your neck right and if Mm -hmm. you're ever not comfortable with anything that I'm doing or you're not sure why I'm doing it just ask me right we can hit pause at any point in time and we can stop and regroup and um, review why we're doing what we're doing Um, so I think that's also important too is is making sure that you um, 
are comfortable enough to lay on the table any concerns that you might have so that they can be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. And how would you describe like what an adjustment actually is for somebody who's never done it before? Mm -hmm. I know people sometimes have this image of like their head just getting cranked or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's actually going on during an adjustment for people? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess um, you often hear like it's the bones being cracked. Uh, That's not true. (laughs) What you hear that cracking noise is actually a cavitation. So it's gas being released from the joint to Mm -hmm. help increase joint mobility. Um, and you actually don't need to hear the audible cavitation or pop or crack in order for the adjustment to be considered successful because at the end of the treatment, what you're looking for is decreased pain and increased mobility. Hmm. Yeah, and there's a pretty big assessment piece that you do as well before oh, 100%. Any, anything's attempted, right? And, oh, 100%, yeah. Um, from the, the little bit of training that, that I've done in, in chiropractic manipulation, like I know that you're you're really targeting in on specific vertebrae and then using very specific techniques and it's all it's all very safe. And I do you do you start doing minips in like first year of your education? Yes. Yeah, and then I mean so the the amount of repetition that you have when you graduate is is insane like thousands and thousands of of reps right yeah in terms of hours put into to try to master that skill for sure um but the other piece that's really important as a healthcare practitioner to consider too is that you do the whole assessment right i do a whole health history a targeted health history on the area of complaint uh personal and family health history as well and then you do the whole physical exam right Mm -hmm. and then I'll lay on the table with someone exactly what I would recommend as the best treatment plan to help them achieve their goals. But again, if they're not comfortable with something I suggest, then we pull from another tool in the toolbox, right? Yeah. So nothing's like set in stone. I very much practice from kind of this three pillar approach of what does the research suggest is going to help this person feel better? What is my clinical experience seeing previous Um, cases similar to this what was successful with those cases and patient preference right what is the patient comfortable with and what are they consenting to yeah that sounds like the evidence-based medicine triad yep 100 (laughs) percent, totally is that last piece is so important i think for people who are doing something for the first time as well right is just knowing that you're going to somebody who they're not just going to do the treatment that they think is going to be the right treatment, but it also needs to be the treatment that you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. right? And I think having that conversation as well, right? And and I usually tie that into when I explain to people at the end of my assessment what I found, what the risk benefits are to treatment, what other treatments might be available, available to them, and kind of piecing together a plan that um, not only do I feel confident that we're going to see results with, but that the patient feels confident that they're going to be able to put in the work to also meet those yeah. end, those end goals. So when you have people coming in with lower back pain, what are some of the most common reasons why people are seeing that? Or what are some of the most common things that you're seeing in your experience? Mm-hmm. So when you look at the research for um, low back pain, it's one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. So kind of like you guys were mentioning at the beginning, it's very, very common. Um, almost everyone will experience an episode of low back pain at least once in their life. And the research is starting to lean away from tissue-specific diagnoses and more nonspecific low back pain. Um, So that's not to say that the structures like muscles, ligaments, nerves, joints aren't contributing to the back pain. But I kind of look at my assessment when I'm working with people with low back pain um, like a teeter-totter and looking at what mental and physical demands are being placed on this individual versus what are their mental and physical resources, right? Because mm. um, usually when there's an imbalance in that teeter-totter, that's when people start to experience some discomfort or pain. Um, and when that discomfort or pain starts to breach into affecting someone's ability to do the things they either have to do or love to do every day, that's when I have an issue with pain, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think a lot of people will come in and I think doing that um, sort of whole person assessment, right? And looking at, okay, well, what are your job demands? What is your personal health history like? What's your sleep quality like? What's your physical activity like? What's your diet like? Um, 
you know, are you doing repetitive motions that might be aggravating or what can we do to help deal with the acute onset of pain in the short term? And then what sort of plan can we put in place to decrease the chances of a flare-up or at least decrease the intensity or frequency of those flare-ups? Yeah. Sounds like the research, again, points towards the unsexy truth of what <laughs> people like. People want to come in and be like, oh, it's this vertebrae is yes. out. So that's why the, I'm experiencing this pain where the research is showing, you know, it's it's oftentimes not one thing. It's it's behavioral. It's habitual. It's all the lifestyle factors that are coming into play. Yeah. Yeah. I think and I, I, get, I can appreciate like it's frustrating. You just want to know the answer, right? Like you just want to be able to say this is why I'm having back pain and this is what I need to do to fix it. Um, but I've had people who have come in with back pain and, um, you know, they're the mental and emotional stressors in their life are flaring their back pain up. So in which, you know, in which case I might say, well, have you considered seeing a psychologist or a counselor, right? And I have other people who come in and, um, you know, they were shoveling snow over the weekend and they have an acute bout of back pain because mm. they just lifted and twisted funny. Um, so again, taking into account the individual in front of you and, and looking at the whole picture and again, trying to put together a plan of management that addresses the pain in the short term and what can be done in the long term to try to minimize the chances of reoccurrence. Mm -hmm. Something that I, I, I see resistance with that I'm constantly trying to communicate to patients about is the impact of mental, emotional health on physical health. And I, I think, Kyle, we've talked about that yep. too. And um, do you, especially in your world, do, do you find that if you're telling someone that their stress or their mental, emotional health can impact their back pain, do you find resistance with that? So what I think I've learned over the handful of years I've been in practice, because I would still consider myself a newer grad, is it really kind of boils down to how you communicate it. And I think the rapport and relationship that's already there. Um, and I think in an, an initial assessment, there's so much going on um, that I will kind of gauge where the person's at and feel that out, right? And, and I usually try to approach it from a place of... Um, not trying to to blame or make it person specific but say like well did you know that the research shows that you know when you're having about of mental or emotional stress that that can increase the pain experience that you might have right mm -hmm. and and usually when you can approach it from that sort of an angle or again i try to use personal examples right like i know for myself like there have been times where my back feels so so sore and i'm like why does my back feel so sore but it's because I have a lot of mental and emotional stress going on in my life. And I know once I um, have the coping tools and resources to deal with that, that my back pain will subside some. So mm -hmm. I think normalizing it, um, because everyone has stress <laughs> in their life, like that's not unique to any one person. Um, so again, I always come back to what tools or resources do you have to manage your stress? Because it's not a matter of whether or not someone has stress in their life. I think it's fair to assume everyone has stress to some degree, but it's how are you coping with that, right? Just like everyone might have back pain to some degree in their life, but how are you coping with it, right? What tools and resources do you have to help you handle those bouts of pain or stress? I think yeah. that's what's more, that's kind of my approach. And I feel mm -hmm. like when the person's ready to talk about it, they'll also respond in such a way where they're open to that conversation, right? And sometimes I lay it out on the table and someone's not ready to have that discussion and I say, that's okay, but you know, just know when you are ready, like you can bring it up with me and I'm happy to have this discussion with you and I'm happy to help you sort of navigate the healthcare system and who might be an appropriate person to see for assistance in that area. Yeah, I, I, I like how you were positioning it as it can increase the, the pain sensitivity and the sensation. I think that's one, a good explanation for people to buy into. Uh, I find particularly men are tough to, to tell that your stress is going to, is, is harming whatever symptom. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, also that, that answer about, well, everybody has stress is one that I get from my patients too. And it's like, yes, but... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, and I think normalizing it, right? Like, you're right. Everyone does have stress. That's not unfactual. Mm -hmm. um, but how each individual copes or manages that stress might be where there's some individual differences, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I like to, to approach it. And I think 
people are more receptive to it when you can normalize it right and say like there's it's neither good nor bad it is what it is but what can we do to help you manage it so your day-to-day isn't so challenging yeah and and if someone is at like point zero or step one where they're like yeah i don't have any i don't know how to manage my stress i've never managed it well um do you have certain ones in your back pocket that you say well try this have you considered this or do you have to get to know the person a bit better I definitely have some tools and resources that I can recommend kind of in my back pocket. Um, I also kind of like to know the individual too, though, because I think um, when you're looking again at sort of the chiro, physio, naturopath, massage, counseling world, what's unique about us is in comparison to, I think, family doctors at times is that we interact with patients more often, right? Mm -hmm. You might only see your family doctor once or twice a year, but you might be coming to see healthcare professionals like us multiple times a year, sometimes even multiple times a month or um, so if it's an acute episode of pain. So I think when you're able to get to know the patient and also able to get to know some healthcare professionals in your circle, being able to match personalities to try to, again, optimize patient outcomes and goals is is important. But I think another factor um, that's important for us to consider is patient resources, right? Um, some people don't have extended healthcare benefits that cover counseling or psychology. Um, and so being also familiar with uh, provincially covered options that you can also recommend to patients, I think is also helpful. Um, And I think it's also, again, taking into the, taking into account patient preference, right? Like what are they Mm -hmm. open to and what are they interested in doing? Like some people might be interested in yoga or meditation. Other people might be looking for more like cognitive behavioral therapy. So again, I think being able to have that sort of a conversation. Um, And I think too, it it doesn't have to be a conversation that starts and, and ends in one go, right? It might Mm -hmm. be something where you lay some ideas out and say, think about it. And the next time we meet, we'll revisit it and we'll talk about it, right? Like it's finding that right starting point. mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that initial assessment becomes so important in terms of understanding their lifestyle, Mm -hmm. right? Somebody, I'll use myself as an example, somebody like me, who's very physical with my job. I'm teaching boot camps. I'm demonstrating exercises all the time, doing massage therapy still also got three kids at home, like constantly using my body and very active, that stress is going to impact my body different than somebody who maybe isn't as active, right? I might, you know, start to feel something flare up in my knee sooner from stress, maybe compared to somebody who maybe sits all day, like they might feel that stress differently. They might feel it, it might, you know, get on their trigger emotional stress much more strongly in them at first. And that's an important thing when you're looking at somebody's actual lifestyle and how they're living too, to bring that up and be like, well, you know, you're very physical with your body on a daily basis. And like you said, like, and the research shows that stress can really impact like heightening some of those feelings that you, some mm-hmm. of that tension that you might have in your body. Yeah. Right? A, f- a friend of mine <clears throat> who's uh, he's a business owner and he's a, he's a, a like a labor worker. And uh, he said he went to his doctor once and they were talking about weight loss or something like that. And his doctor said, well, you just you just got to be more active. And he's like, I'm I'm on my feet active, not eating lunch for nine hours a day. And he was just blown away that that was the advice that his his doctor was giving him. You have to be more active. He's like, I'm active. Like, seriously, you should follow me around for a day. Like, I'm the most active person you could imagine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Something else different is going on or whatever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's not what that person needs who's toiling for nine hours in the sun is to be more active. That's insane. We're missing something here, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think some of those topics, too, can be sensitive topics for people right so approaching them with um like grace and dignity and acknowledging where someone's at um i think goes a long way right and it it leaves a a more positive impression i think than someone like your friend who's a business owner for example where the advice that they were given doesn't match what they're living and what they're experiencing right Mm mm-hmm well, it almost, I um, would imagine it almost makes them feel like they have nowhere to go from there. They're like, well, that's mm-hmm. the answer. Like, 
I've, I'm already doing everything then, so I'm just doomed to be the way that I am. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's no, there's no like open door of like, well, maybe there's something else. Like, well, <laughs> maybe you need to move more. Move more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I can't stop moving. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, and that's why we exist, and hopefully people know that. But uh, I definitely see people come to me that are like, yeah, I just I haven't been heard. I haven't been seen. I haven't been heard. And yes, a, a lot of, of that. Yeah, yeah, a lot of that too. And I think a lot of that, like, you know, when I get feedback from some of my patients, I think a lot of them I see over and over, at least in some of the written testimonials I've gotten over the years, is that they were really hesitant to try Cairo, but they were in so much pain that they booked an appointment with a Cairo, even with some hesitation and reservation. But they felt so much more at ease with how thorough and detail oriented um, at least my approach to care is mm -hmm. and giving them the opportunity to share their story and express concerns or expectations or ideas or previous poor experiences in healthcare or whatever the case may be. Um, and I think when people feel heard, it eases some of that fear or anxiety. I mean, it goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people do just have a reservation of sharing, right? Mm -hmm. It's they're maybe not even, you know, afraid to, to try that thing, but they're just afraid to, they just want that quick fix. And so they, they don't want to go somewhere where they're going to have to, um, you know, put in the process, but you, I mean, you just can't avoid the process no matter what. Otherwise, you just continue the cycle of pain, right? So I, I agree. I think it's so important to give them that, that welcoming feeling and like, hey, I'm on your team, right? I do want to help you and let's find the, the perfect starting point for you and then build off of it. I mm -hmm. think it's so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it kind of aligns with, I think, the work that you guys do in the sense of sustainability, right? Like mm -hmm. I might, my goals for a patient might not match what their goals for themselves are. So I could create the best treatment plan in the world, but if it doesn't resonate with that patient, neither one of us are going to be satisfied with the outcome because neither one of us are going to get the outcome that we want. Yeah. So I think meeting people where they're at um, is a great starting point because once people start to see results and start to get that momentum, they're more likely to maintain those healthy habits. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's why in within that uh, triad of evidence-based medicine, there's, uh, there's patient values and preferences. And that's because if you, yeah, if you want to see positive outcomes in the treatment plan, the person has to be on board or else it's just not going to work. Yeah. And so, you know, think so, yeah, I, I found I thought that was really interesting. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, that's patient values is evidence based. That's so naturopathic, whatever. And then I realized that I, I believe it first appeared in nursing that uh, that evidence based medicine triad. And so at least there there's that awareness mm -hmm. across the board and across professions now that. Mm -hmm. It's it's about the individualized approach. The blanket approach um, just doesn't work very well. It leaves people disenfranchised, and so it's it's great to hear because that's what I know that the the naturopathic doctors, especially the the newer grads, are trying to do, um, and it sounds like that's what you're trying to do, and that's probably been a criticism, maybe I don't know of chiro chiropractic in in the past of. Um, and kind of the old guard and, and just doing things their way and kind of these set, you know, set systems and things like that. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of just been healthcare in general, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I think I see it so much more frequently now where patients in general are more comfortable and confident questioning their healthcare provider, right? Like, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? Yeah. What other options do I have? Whereas I think, you know, if we were to look back a few generations it was kind of like well they're the doctor they know what they're doing I will just follow them blindly right like I, I will do as they say because they know and I don't um, whereas I think now at least I try to to have this shift in my practice and I, I see it with my patients where um, like yes I'm I'm the expert in the the content right I'm the expert in MSK Healthcare, but musculoskeletal. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but um, you're the expert in you. I don't live with you twenty four seven. I don't know what your day to day looks like. I don't know what your pain experience is like. I don't know what your work demands are like. I don't know what your home demands are like. Right. So I think blending the two, it just you get further. Yeah, 
Yeah, I see it in fitness nutrition as well. Like it really resonates through that industry also where I think people get have gotten used to, like you mentioned, and, and almost stuck in this. Like, no, I don't want to think about it. I just want to go get my treatment plan and follow it without realizing that that treatment plan that you're being given mm -hmm. is likely not sustainable for you long term. So while you might like to have that, that direction and that guidance, much like a diet, like it's probably not going to work long term unless we actually get to like what is right for you like yeah. what can you actually do what are you actually ready to do what are you actually able to do yeah. what are you willing to do right now yeah well and it's interesting because i think I, I have had patients where they're just like tell me what to do and i'll do it um and again i'll meet them where they're at and mm -hmm. i'll do that for them um but along the way you try to educate right and as again, that rapport and relationship is built and more trust is built. Um, I tend to see people start to shift away from the, I'll just do as you tell me to do and start to take a little bit more of an active role in their, their health and well-being. Yeah. And I know one thing that you and I kind of talked about beforehand was like home care, like stuff that you, stuff, stuff that you can do on your own to, to help yourself and really finding something that's like, you know, so many times not to like definitely not bashing on other professions and, and modalities and stuff but oftentimes I'll get people who have gone to see a physiotherapist or something and uh, or even a chiropractor or even a massage therapist and they have this like laundry list of exercises and stretches that they have to do every single day and and they're so defeated because they're like I just like can't keep up with this stuff I'm like choose one like what's one that feels really good that really helps mm -hmm. do that one thing like once you got that down then see if you feel comfortable adding in another one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and that's i think a really important thing for people to understand too is you don't have to do it all like you can you can build you can start small and build right? mm -hmm. i think too like i had um i had someone share something really interesting in my opinion um they were participating in the the glad back program which is a group education and exercise rehab class for individuals with persistent or recurrent uh, low back pain and we were chatting one day and they said you know like the exercises i'm doing they're not anything i haven't seen before right like i've had back pain for years now and i've been to a variety of different healthcare professionals and these aren't new per se but what's different about it is if i were to have been given the exercise sheet and told to do it at home and it caused me some pain or discomfort i would have stopped doing it because i wouldn't have known whether it was benefiting me or harming me but when i come into the supervised exercise class and i'm telling you that i'm feeling some pain or discomfort and you're telling me it's okay it's okay right you're doing something new with your body and your body's adapting to it and it might be a little uncomfortable to start but just stick with it um they were like i stuck with it and now i see the results of being consistent with exercise rehab versus being sent home with uh, a handout with pictures and descriptions of exercises to do, but without um, the same sort of guidance um, and what's, you know, hurt versus harm and what's acceptable discomfort and what's kind of, you know, too much that might increase your chances of a flare up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're talking about like group supervised um, exercise classes is th this is part of what you do now is this part of the glad back mm -hmm. program so let's get into that a little bit sure yeah so i am currently one of four chiropractors in calgary certified to offer the glad back program and it's a research-based program out of the university of alberta and it's a group education and exercise rehab class for individuals with recurrent or persistent low back pain and the purpose of the Glad Back program is to help teach people how to self-manage their low back pain. Um, and so I can offer it both virtually and in person. Um, so as long as you're a resident in Alberta, you may be eligible for the program. Um, and what I, I, well, I mean, I really like a lot of aspects about <laughs> the Glad Back program, but I think the, the great highlights of it are um, but it is very research-based, um, both in the sense that when you look at the research for recommendations on how to manage low back pain, education, reassurance, and exercise rehab are first-line interventions. Hmm. Um, and that's exactly what this program does. Yeah. The other thing I really like about it is um, for people out there who have low back pain, um, but maybe have some hesitation or reservation when it comes to manual therapy, whether it be with 
you know, a chiropractor and adjustments or spinal manipulations or a physiotherapist um, or, you know, I know people who don't even like getting massages, which mm. blows my mind, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are people out there who don't like it. Yeah. Um, it's a very hands-off program. So after the initial assessment with some baseline testing, it's all education and exercise rehab. So you work through the program at your own pace um, and I'm there to kind of help guide you as needed. Uh, so it's a really great option for people who, yeah, don't want to see a Cairo, don't want any of that manual care um, component, but still have low back pain and don't know what to do with it. Um, and another really great thing is it's pretty cost um, affordable, in, in my opinion. So the, the entire program is $640, and it may be eligible for reimbursement through your chiropractic healthcare benefits um, hmm. because I'm the one overseeing it as a chiropractor. Yeah. It, it's nice because you've got education, you've got accountability, right? It really is kind of coaching people through that that initial phase of well, what can you do on your own, mm -hmm. how to understand what's actually going on a little bit better, which mm -hmm. really I think what we've touched on is what kind of steers people away or holds people back a lot of the times is just like, I don't really understand what it is or I don't know what I'm getting myself into. It kind of allows people to get their feet wet a little bit first, but it also allows you the opportunity to give people what they need mm -hmm. um, without even having to see them face to face. Well, and pain is scary. Like I, if you don't understand why you're in pain, it's mm -hmm. scary. Like even I'm, you know, a trained healthcare professional, but when I experience pain that I don't understand it's scary you're like well what's going on what's wrong with me what do I need to do um, and again then that heightens your stress <laughs> and your anxiety around it which in turn just heightens your pain experience so it kind yep. of becomes this vicious loop um, which is why I think it's really important to have a healthcare team that you feel confident in being able to go to and that you trust is going to give you good recommendations for the best possible outcome for you and has your best interests at heart because yeah yeah it, it, that education piece alone I mean I've had patients who have come into the clinic and they're you know really anxious and really nervous and really stressed about their pain but by the end of the visit once you provide some of that education and reassurance they leave and they feel confident that they are going to get better right <laughs> and that alone that alone plays into someone's prognosis or outcome and, and oh, it's yeah. so f funny that you er said earlier that stress can increase the pain uh sensation and almost like create a hypersensitivity environment and then what you're actually doing is relieving the stress by incorporating education mm -hmm. uh, we were just doing that with uh with man's shoulder here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was laughing when you were saying that because I was like, oh man, this resonates very well right now. Yeah, we were just doing some education uh, this morning actually um, to, to really elucidate and figure out what's going on. Because he's like, yeah, I got pain grading kind of down the back of my arm and into the forearm. Like, that's probably radial nerve. Let's opened up the uh, anatomy program to see the possible points where it could be compressed. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's probably being compressed, you know, in the scalenes or under the clavicle as it becomes the brachial plexus there. And uh, I hope you're relieved just to know that, yeah, okay, well, it's one of those two things. And so I just got to like, that's why. Oh, know. totally. And like what, like what you were just saying, like I said, it resonates so much with me just even in the this last week where it's so true. Like even as a practitioner, I'm like, it could be a million different things. And when you don't know where it could be coming from, it's, it's just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, I've tried to like massage this point. I've tried to, you know, I tried to get a massage. I tried mm. this and that. And like you feel like you've tried everything mm -hmm. and until you actually have somebody, which, you know, I have Dr. Riley who I, who I trust and who's uh, brilliant with, with acupuncture and just with the anatomy of the body and stuff like that too. So I, you know, immediately as soon as the pain got so bad i was like i need you <laughs> i need you come in and i'm somebody who like we've talked before about like my body has reservations with acupuncture where like i get i tense up just from past acupuncture experiences that i've had with i've had good experiences and i've had experiences where my body just doesn't react well to it mm -hmm. and like having a practitioner like dr riley who really makes me feel comfortable in it and like really it says like okay we're only going to do what you're comfortable with today like it really does kind of ease you into that process mm -hmm. um and so kudos to you for understanding that about chiropractic as well and 
understanding that it's really important to meet the the patient where they're at mm -hmm. and not just like i want to get results for you because <laughs> i see that in fitness all the time it's like i'm only going to work with people who are willing to you know commit to this it's like well how is that actually helping that person beyond your program though mm -hmm. right or beyond your mm -hmm. your impact on them how does that help them it's almost kind of like selfish right when it's kind of it goes back to what you said where you can build right you can mm -hmm. build you don't have to go zero to a hundred i mean i don't even know if it I don't I never recommend going zero to 100 overnight because it's just not sustainable yeah. and it's overwhelming. And if you can't build those healthy habits and feel confident that you can stick to them, then you start to feel kind of like a failure. Right. And, you're, and then it just decreases your chances of sticking with it and making those making that progress. Right. I think the other thing, too, I, I tell patients is. Um, like we're human, right? Like we can build healthy habits and then life can happen and we can start to lose some of those healthy habits. But that doesn't mean that we can't get back on yeah. track, right? Yeah, I see that all the time. People feel guilty that they fell off a little bit and now they're stuck dealing with that very powerful negative emotion. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm always telling people just you just get back on yeah. and you just forgive yourself yeah. and like it's not a big deal it's no. that's just to be human but this, this happens with me in supplements like all the time mm. like i recommend oh yeah you know try this at try some curcumin it might help with your inflammation or joint pain or whatever and then i meet with them a month later and they said oh yeah i, I missed a day or i missed two days and then i just didn't get started again and there's you can tell there's i'm just like that's okay just start again tomorrow yeah it's, like, it's really it's yeah. all good yeah. yeah i think i think it's true i think um especially kind of in like our society that that perceived level of like perfection or yeah um you know you're always hearing people talking about like being consistent and sticking to it and da da da, da. but i don't think it leaves a lot of grace for life yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and life happens usually at the most inconvenient of times mm -hmm. and it can derail you from some of the progress you were making but oh, yeah. that doesn't mean that you can't get back to building those healthy habits like yeah. you did it once you can do it again right mm -hmm. just pick a monday mondays are a great day to re try to restart <laughs> something again i'm yeah. constantly doing that even as the naturopathic doctor like i'm constantly being like okay monday i'm gonna restart this again like start start the meditation yeah. start the yeah yeah or right after vacations or something right people yeah. go away and they they don't have their regular routine and then they come back and getting back into that routine can be a little bit challenging but you do it right mm -hmm. so i just yeah. tell people you're you're always one meal away from being back on track mm -hmm. right and it goes I like that it goes with everything it's like you're one supplement away from being back on track you're one stretch away from being back on track with your regimen you're one appointment away mm -hmm. like you're not you, your process doesn't end no like even if you think your process has ended it doesn't i always mm. tell people especially with nutrition but it resonates across the board with with all health uh, practitioners and but you know it's not like you just like can stop eating if you stop eating like you're gonna eventually die <laughs> right so it's like your your diet never ends mm -hmm. so if you you know start eating differently you're just eating differently and mm -hmm. you can start eating differently again mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you've like failed or that you're you're done now it's yeah it's just eating yeah right? i had a patient once who i didn't see for like three or four months and they ended up back in my schedule and they were like i was almost embarrassed to book the appointment because mm -hmm. i haven't been in in so long and i was like don't be like time flies like it happens i just yeah. just call it and make the appointment and and make that commitment to yourself to get back on track and you'll do it right yeah yeah i, I want to share something from the world of uh ad addiction recovery and uh one of the most um i would say stand out and powerful differences between those who succeed and eventually figure out their addiction and those who don't is that um when lapses happen, lapses are kind of like temporary mess ups and things like that, and you fell off. Relapses are longer term, kind of downward spirals. But so the difference between those who succeed and those who don't is um, those who experience lapses, those who succeed, they forgive themselves immediately and try to see it as a, a learning opportunity. So you don't just forgive yourself and go, well, what, what? you'd forgive yourself and then go, well, how did that happen? Let's retrace the steps. Oh, right. I saw that neon open sign on the liquor store and that was my trigger. And they learn from it. 
um, and they realize that it's going to take a few times. Those people succeed. The people who who fail and get down on themselves and let guilt and, and all that take over, they don't succeed. And that's that's the biggest difference um, yep. in that world. So there's there's some parallels. Mm-hmm. Here I, was just, as well. I was just talking with a client just I think last week about this, and is in regards to a boot camp that we have, and and they missed. I think a week and a half of boot camp, and they're like, I almost didn't come back. And we got talking about it. And it's like we create these stories in our mind of like what other people are thinking. And this particular person, um, like they had created these stories of like, like people were going to be like, Well, where were you? Like thinking that they're lazy or that they just didn't want to be there and stuff like that. And like what was really happening was people were like, Is everything okay? Like I hope yeah. things are okay with them and stuff. And like people genuinely like, cared about you and like we just wanted like wanted to make sure but we create these stories in our mind of either like stories about ourselves like this means that i'm lazy or stories that like other people like oh if i go see my chiropractor again and it's been a month they're gonna think like i just like i don't appreciate them or like we create these crazy stories in our mind (laughs) when really most people are intuitively good most people oh, intuitively yeah. want to help you it's so true if i don't see patients for a while i'm always like man i hope everything's okay yeah. with them like yeah. i really hope i hope things are okay right you don't you don't think that anything poorly of them you're just like it would be so nice to know i i really enjoy building rapports and relationships with mm-hmm. my patients right and so i like um i like f- being a part of their healthcare team and their healthcare circle and seeing them through um, and so when people fall off the map, that's usually my first thought is, I hope everything's okay. I hope nothing crazy happened in their life, and I hope all is well. Yeah. And in even with like with that boot camp example or, or in your practice, I'm sure you're very grateful and happy to see them. I'm sure all those people were happy to see that person, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. the opposite. Well, because you just want to support, right? Like yeah. in any, like whether it's the boot camp and that community setting um, with other participants is you just, you want to to support them and helping them to achieve their their goals right yeah so yep we've talked a little bit like a lot about stress and and lifestyle behaviors and stuff that can impact lower back pain what are some of the actual physical things that that you do run into frequently Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's soft tissue or Mm -hmm. maybe it's something like scoliosis and those types of things like what are some of the more common things that we do see in our society right now yeah, so I mean, the body likes variety of movement. So, so again, I think one of the myths out there um, that the research, the newer research, is starting to debunk is this idea of like good posture and bad posture, right? Mm. Um, I always say your best posture is your next posture because the body likes that variety of movement. It doesn't like prolonged standing, prolonged sitting, prolonged lying, static postures of any sort, um, which is is challenging kind of in our society with people who maybe do a lot of desk work, right? Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side, I also see, you know, firefighters or police officers or first responders who... um, arguably have maybe more of a physical job than the desk worker, but they're also still experiencing discomfort or pain. Um, and I think it it boils down to some of those repetitive motions or tasks or demands that you're putting on yourself. And so trying to find ways to counterbalance that, right? Um, so, you know, you're not going to be able to eliminate your desk job. I mean, that's your livelihood, right? So how can we counteract that? And And that might look like, I mean, it's different for every person, but it might be like, okay, well, every 20 or 30 minutes, can you stand up for a minute, right? Or it might look like, okay, well, what stretch can we give you so that when you're sitting at your desk, you can perform this throughout the day to help um, ease that that kind of building discomfort of, of sitting for eight hours or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it dives into a little bit of that lifestyle piece of teasing out what the day-to-day looks like but then also saying, okay, and what are ways to combat that so that it kind of balances out that teeter-totter and it's mm-hmm. not off kilter one way or the other. Yeah, <clears throat> we were talking with uh, like a movement and exercise phys um, expert not too long ago, Mr. Benson, right? Yeah. And uh, he was he mentioned something and he said, 
pattern disruption mm -hmm. is, is, is your friend. And that's the term he used. And I remember we were t t asking people, hey, did you listen to the episode? What do you think? And they, uh, most people, and to me too, that part really jumped out to everyone. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. like, oh, and he's like, yeah, just go clean a bathtub and don't go do something a little bit different and lean over and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not if you have low back pain. It could, be, <laughs> it could be a bad example. We could be working up to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was saying, yeah, just like, you know, get down on your hands, do, do different things and mm -hmm. do it for... 60 seconds but he was about pattern disruption i thought that was yeah really cool and uh something that i've been doing because i have you know home-based business and do a lot of virtual care and i find myself at a desk working quite a bit um and like no i can't afford a three or four hundred dollar standing desk converter or, or whatever they cost so i bought a twenty dollar music stand and put the the stand kind of horizontal and i just placed my laptop on that and everything secures and i got one Brilliant. of those uh standing pads that you can get at home depot you know for your kitchen mm -hmm. and so now i have like a comfy pad and a music so i have a standing desk for you know forty dollars or whatever yeah and um I find that mentally too it really helps i can kind of be stuck in something and uh you don't have to stand forever i'll stand for an, half an hour or an hour but mm -hmm. i find it just uh yeah it just helps my clarity a little bit yeah. it just kind of jostles things jostles that yeah. uh yeah it just changes your positioning right you're mm -hmm. not in that static prolonged posture mm -hmm. i always tell people too like drink lots of water because then you're gonna have to go to the bathroom and that'll get you up and away Ooh. from your desk yeah. and it increases your water intake right so it's yep. a win-win um but anything that that changes your and it doesn't have to be anything grand like even crossing your legs one way crossing your, like, your legs the other way like even those little shifts that you do seated yeah. um that's better than nothing right it goes back to that well, anything's better than than nothing right um so trying to build some of those habits into your day-to-day -day, uh will have long-term effects mm-hmm yeah, and if you want to get really spicy, you can yeah go fold laundry or do dishes. I know yeah. we're that's what we do on our breaks. I, we're crazy though. I don't know that's pretty pretty intense. Yeah, I was gonna say like even our last episode, we were talking a lot about movement and just the impact of movement and stuff. So that's it's something that you're seeing across the board with practitioners now, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, but just the importance of moving your body and moving your body in different ways is yeah. so huge. I mean research shows that exercise is bad for nothing right and it doesn't have to be crazy you don't have to go out and and be the power lifter yeah um you just have to move and get variety of movement into your day as much as possible yeah and that's something i've personally tried to do as well when i'm uh i just structured my week and, and structured my workouts and uh I'm like, okay, what can I truly do? Okay, let's start with like three times a week is, is let, that's realistic for me. So like, you know, this day is weights and then this day is hit and then this day is go for a run and I'm trying to do that and, and really mix it up. And then mm -hmm. a, the bonus, if I get a fourth day, is just going to be a stretch. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and, and, and I'm loving it because then you're also, um, it, I guess it depends what your brain is like. Some people love the same thing all the time, but that's likely not good and you're just gonna, body's going to adapt anyway. But I find that my brain, when I'm thinking about my next workout, it's, it's, it's new. I haven't mm -hmm. done it for a week and I'm mm -hmm. a little, just a little bit more excited to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and that's the thing too. I think sometimes people um, think they have to run, but they hate running right so then they don't want to do it but there's so many types of exercise out there like yeah. find the one that you enjoy doing and it'll be easier for you to do and easier for you to make time for in your schedule because it's something that brings you joy and it doesn't yeah. feel like yeah. a chore right and, and force yourself to try different things too like don't get stuck in like oh i'm not a soccer player it's like well, play soccer like try it like that's something i'm really passionate about with our fitness classes that we run is understanding that exercise like doesn't it's not a uniform thing that like this exercise counts and this doesn't like the other day we played soccer at the end of our boot camp like that was the last 30 minutes of boot camp was one of somebody's kid brought a soccer ball and i was like hey can we use that and we literally played a soccer game for like 40 minutes and uh, like everybody worked super hard they were sweating yeah they were smiling they were mm -hmm. laughing like we had fun like that's what it's all about like move your body in ways that feel good mm -hmm. relieves stress mm -hmm. moves your muscles in different ways that you didn't move them before it's i mean that's the recipe i think mm -hmm. that's what the research shows yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and what is rewarded and satis like what's rewarded is um repeated and so if 
you're having fun that's a type of reward mm-hmm. and, and satisfaction and you're going to repeat it and yeah that's or even finding key. that community right like if you're going mm-hmm. to a class and you mm-hmm. like all the people in the class right well now you're getting a social component to it right um a support component to it a physical activity component to it a stress reduction component to it like i think classwork and maybe i'm a little bit biased in saying this but i think classwork offers a lot of great benefits yeah yeah and finding a community not even just in in terms of a class but even in terms of practitioners like Mm -hmm. it's something that that the three of us have talked about a little bit is really finding a community of practitioners that you do trust that you do feel are actually working together i know we have a mutual client that um uh, that uses uh, some of our massage therapists they go and see you for chiropractic care Mm -hmm. they've used dr riley as well and they're like i finally feel like i actually have like a team of people who are working together on like one thing Mm -hmm. and I think that's so important to have and so kudos to you as a practitioner as well to be willing to work with other practitioners also and um, that yeah that's a big takeaway for me from this conversation listening to you as well as just like the, the willingness to work together and work with your client as well is so huge yeah and I I think that's a passion area of mine right is that interprofessional collaboration piece um because as as educated as i am i don't know everything and i will never know everything right and so being able to have um, a trusted circle of colleagues to bounce ideas off of or to send a patient referral for a second opinion or for a different approach um, again it all comes back to what what do you think is going to benefit the patient and get them closer to the goals that you want to see for them and that they want to see for themselves yeah yeah um just quickly is weight loss ever part of 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 the picture where what you recommend people for low back pain i was gonna ask that were too. you no yeah. way i just i <laughs> must have just caught your brain <laughs> yeah. it's such a good question and it's one that that comes up often enough i would say in practice um and and definitely a narrative that I hear from other healthcare professionals telling, you know, mutual patients. Um, What we know about low back pain is that it's just so multifactorial, right? Um, And so I always, and and weight loss is a a little bit of a a touchy or sensitive topic for people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when someone brings that up with me, I always ask them, have you noticed that when you started to gain weight, your back pain worsened? Because if the answer is yes, then maybe there is some sort of relationship or pattern there with weight gain and an increase of low back pain. But if you've had low back pain for 10, 15 years, and in the last year you've put on 15 pounds, it's a little bit harder for me to say, okay, weight loss is going to be the thing that makes your back pain feel better because it's just not there. It's so easy for people to also just go... Oh, I'm, my my back hurts. I'm so out of shape, right? Or for me, like, oh, well, my shoulder hurts. It'd be so easy to be like, I'm so out of shape. Like, I should be exercising more or something like that. Because, like, when I really think about it, I'm like, no, I'm actually exercising quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Like, that's actually not the case. But it's so easy to just link. Like, we seem to yeah. have a reaction to go to that of like, oh, I'm so out of shape. And and it's all relative to that individual as well, right? Like, there are people out there who, um their diet could be better, their physical activity could be better, um, and their body condition could be better. Um, And I I think it's a worthwhile conversation to have, but for me, it's more important, well, in my opinion, it's usually more of the like, let's get you to an overall healthier place because Mm -hmm. your quality of life is going to be better, right? And if, if your quality of life is better in the sense that you now have more energy to do more physical activity, that in turn is going to help your low back pain, right? Yeah. Um, I really, I really dislike blaming low back pain on one specific, yeah, like structure or incident or um, cause because it, it it is so multifactorial and it's so individual specific, and it's individual specific even in the sense of like pain is a subjective experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like my tolerance for pain is going to be different than yours, is going to be different from yours. And so you have to take that into account as well. Um, 
so yeah, we, I always ask people, and it's usually when they bring it up with me, right? They've been like, oh, I saw my family doctor and my family doctor just said I needed to lose some weight and my back pain would be better. Or, you know, I know I'm carrying a little bit more weight and I'm sure if I lost the weight, my back pain would feel better. Yeah. My next question is usually, have you noticed that when you started to see an increase in weight gain, your back pain worsened or began? Mm-hmm. And majority of the time, the answer is no, because <laughs> people have back pain often enough um, and once you have back pain once the research shows you're more likely to experience it again and it kind of waxes and wanes yeah um it's that holistic approach yeah. too right where it's like well if you start exercising more and you're moving your body in different ways you're likely going to be putting yourself in a better position to maybe lose some weight mm-hmm. and who knows if it's because you lost weight or if it's because you started moving your body more the end result is what really matters and even more ripple effects from that right like um your cardiovascular health right your blood pressure or your cholesterol or your insulin levels if you're you know potentially diabetic or pre like it all it all ties in right it goes back to that like i like to say exercise is bad for nothing right like you just Mm -hmm. get out there and move and you'll see and 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 consistently whether you can swing three times a week five times a week like whatever is consistent for you you'll see the benefits yeah. wonderful well we're at the top of the hour here so dr rebecca chiropractor ambassador of the glad back program <laughs> tell us how uh, people can find you get a hold of you yeah great question so um you can find me on instagram facebook and linkedin if you search dr rebecca McAllister. If you Google my name, Dr. Rebecca McAllister, you will find a Google My Business with my website, which is also based on my name. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and send me a message. I love to chat about this sort of stuff. So <laughs> yeah. if you're experiencing low back pain, make sure you reach out to Dr. Rebecca. And, uh, and we'll include those links in our show notes as well for this episode. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on. This Thank is you fun. so much for having me. Yeah, it's always great chatting with you guys. I feel like we could talk forever. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, let's do it again. Yeah, thanks for coming Sounds by. That's good. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. For additional support or to work with one of us one-on-one, go to our website, www.wellnessdojo.ca. You can also find us on Instagram, at wellnessdojoyyc, or on all other social media platforms searching The Wellness Dojo. We'll see you in the next episode.